Good morning. Come on, y'all. I know we just ate a meal, but say good morning with me. Good morning. It is really an honor and a pleasure to be here to, to Michelle's point to see you all in person for the first time in a couple of years as we celebrate the life and the legacy on the 94th birthday of Dr. King. And I just want to begin with a couple of acknowledgments. It's so great to have our First Lady, Crystal Gilmore, join us and so many friends and family in the audience to our many, many sponsors, including Prudential and pse and and the Garden State Bar Association, of which I'm a proud member. As Michael mentioned, my name is Ryan Hagelin. I lead the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice. We were founded more than 20 years ago by Alan Lowenstein, and his vision for the Institute would be that we would be an organization that uses advocate to empower communities to knock down what we think of as load-bearing walls of structural inequality to open up opportunities. And so for me to be here, when Michael asked me to speak, I was excited immediately because there's a story that I've been wanting to tell about the way that the Newark YMCA is anchored in our communities, providing spaces for folks when they can't find those spaces in other places. And so I've been practicing now for 20 years. I came to the Northeast 20 years ago as an intern at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Folks know that was founded by the first, and some argue Judge Greenaway's clerks, the only black Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall until recently when Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson joined the court. And it was, to be sure, the internship of a lifetime. I learned about the Legal Defense Fund when I was in high school watching the black and white Eyes in the Prize videos that, as you all know, chronicled the civil rights movement. And I decided at that time that I wanted to be a civil rights attorney. And so I got this opportunity of a lifetime to intern at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Then it was located in downtown New York City. And I recently met my father around this time. I did not grow up with him. I met him when I was 21. I told him I got this internship. He, he was living then in Brooklyn. And he said, you know, Ryan, you should come stay with me in Brooklyn during the summer of your internship. Now, you all are thinking, as I just shared, that's a risky proposition given that I didn't grow up with my father. Met him when I was 21. Keep that in your mind. I arrive in New York City. Go to Brooklyn on a Friday night. It is a beautiful summer evening. My father and I play basketball. We have pizza, all good. Saturday night, same thing, some basketball, some pizza, all good. Sunday morning, I wake up early. I just want to do a test run to take the train into Manhattan for my internship. Monday morning, I'm up very early. I have my suit on. I'm ready to go. I'm excited. Again, I'm going to intern at the organization Thurgood Marshall founded. And as I'm preparing to go, my father says to me, you know, this is day three, by the way, son, I didn't appreciate how crowded it would be with you here. <laughs> I told you it was a risky proposition. I say, bet, my father leaves for work. I pack up my things into my suitcase, and I get to the Legal Defense Fund very early, and thankfully, someone from the cleaning team was there, and she let me in. I hid my suitcase in the library because you all know you can't be that intern on day one who shows up to the job with a suitcase, <laughs> right? The optics there are suboptimal. And so I hide my suitcase in the library and I proceed as if everything is fine. On my lunch hour, I call my then girlfriend who was then teaching in Newark. She's also from Denver, Charity, then Shouse. Now, hey, good. And I say to Charity, listen, Charity, I have a little bit of a situation. I need a place to stay. Is there somewhere I can stay in Newark? Immediately she says, well, you can't stay with me. <laughs> right? This is cold, cold blooded. You can't stay. But, but the Newark YMCA is also residential. And so I called the Newark Y. And, and I promise you, an angel answered the phone. And I was embarrassed to share, but I shared my story with her and that I needed a place to stay. She said, you can stay here for the student rate, which was then $8 a day. And I said, ma'am, God bless you. I'll be there. Thing is, I got to wait for everybody to leave because, again, I have my suitcase. 
And so I took the PATH train to the city of Newark. I got here about 8 o'clock. I went to the Newark Y. My key was waiting for me at 531. And that key opened the door to the Newark Y, which then opened up for me a love for this city of Newark. And I've been wanting to tell that story to folks who understand and love the Newark YMCA under Michael Bright's leadership and before the previous CEO, because this, when people talk about anchor institutions, this is what it looks like. There was another person who came to the city of Newark, New Jersey, 55 years ago in March. And you all know that was Dr. King, Martin Luther King Jr. And he came to the city of Newark to build grassroots support for the Poor People's Campaign. This, as you all know, would be his final fight for racial justice. And the story goes, as you all know, that eight days later, he spoke at a mass meeting in Memphis, Tennessee. The speech that he gave the night before in Memphis, Tennessee, will be the last of his life. And it became one of his most iconic speeches. Do you all know this one as the, I have been to the mountaintop speech? The next day, Dr. King was assassinated on a balcony at the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, Tennessee. 55 years later, as we gather this morning for this breakfast, and as we celebrate his 94th birthday this weekend, we are inspired to tend to Dr. King's unfinished business. And I think this is a significant time to do it because we're in a time that's marked by very incredible challenges alongside some really incredible opportunities. Indeed, as we gather in person this morning, we continue to emerge from a COVID-19 pandemic that has profoundly impacted all of us, and some of us personally in unimaginable ways. The pandemic reminds us that each of us stand on a foundation that is cracked by structural racism, and particularly in the last couple of years, we've seen those cracks erupt into earthquakes in black communities. Indeed, COVID-19 was the leading cause of death of black people in New Jersey in 2020. But as you all know, even before the pandemic, black people in New Jersey already faced some of the worst racial inequality in America. And we like to think of ourselves in New Jersey as both progressive and forward thinking. And while I think this is an important part of our story, it's also true that in too many ways, 55 years after Dr. King came to visit the city of Newark, our state remains a modern day version of the two Americas that Dr. King spoke of. In white New Jersey, for example, the median household wealth is $322,500. But in black New Jersey, the median household wealth is just $17,000. $700. Think about that. A more than $300,000 racial wealth gap. To be clear, New Jersey's two, uh, the two New Jerseys were designed during our founding as a colony when we were referred to as the slave state of the North. It was at our founding as a colony that New Jersey gave each English white settling family 150 acres of land. And it gave those same families an additional 150 acres of land for each enslaved black person that they brought with them. That was here. That was our story. That was, and in many ways remains, who New Jersey was and is. And so by 1830, over two-thirds of all enslaved people were held captive right here in New Jersey. And after we became the last northern state to finally end slavery formally, we developed our own form of, of, of sharecropping. Here we called it cottaging. Well, why, Ryan? In 2023, on the 55th anniversary of Dr. King's visit to, New, to Newark and to New Jersey, on the 52nd anniversary of this breakfast, why are you, Ryan, talking about that legacy of slavery in New Jersey? And the answer is this, because slavery didn't just happen back then. All of us live in the shadow of, we live with the vestiges of slavery and its enduring impact in this very moment. You can draw a direct line from the history of slavery in New Jersey and its enduring impact 
to today's racial wealth gap. And the reason that the history is so important is because if you remove from the conversation around racial disparities, if you remove the history, then what you're left with is that the reason that racial disparities exist related to black folks is because there's something wrong with black folks. There's something prodigal about the way we spend. There's something wrong about how we do things. These are personal failures. But as you all know, these racial disparities were by design. And so much of Dr. King's life was about recognizing that these cracks in our foundation were put there intentionally and that we as people of conscience and people of faith are required to redesign a system where we build a new foundation to repair those cracks. Dr. King recognized that the solutions to these and other challenges are found in our communities from the ground up. Because while his impact certainly changed the world, his work, his efforts to build power were intensely local. As he said, power, properly understood, is the ability to achieve purpose. It is the strength required to bring about social, political, and economic changes. Dr. King recognized that advocacy is power. And so inspired by Dr. King, we at the Institute, with so many of you all partners in this room and beyond it, have been working to build power in communities across New Jersey, advocating from the ground up in our communities, advocating in the streets, advocating in the legislature, advocating in the courtroom. And so while, for example, Jim Crow-like voter suppression tactics have taken root across the country, we've been working in New Jersey to build a beacon for democracy. Together, we restored the right to vote to 83,000 people, including our colleague Ron Pierce, who are on probation or parole, a right that was previously denied since the year 1844, and we're working to do the same for people who are currently incarcerated. And together, our advocacy ended New Jersey's modern-day three-fifths compromise so that incarcerated people are counted in their home communities for purposes of legislative redistricting as opposed to the prison communities where they're housed. We achieved online voter registration through which more than 400,000 people registered in the year 2020 and beyond. And on the same day that Georgia passed a shameful package of voter suppression bills, our advocacy led to New Jersey creating nine days of early voting. And tying all of this democracy work together, we launched a campaign to get the New Jersey legislature to create a New Jersey Reparations Commission. Now, a lot will be said today appropriately about Dr. King's dream. A lot appropriately will be said about Dr. King's dream. But to understand the dream, we have to acknowledge the way that it was rooted in the ongoing fight for freedom and liberation. And you can't realize Dr. King's dream without doing work to repair the enduring harm for slavery. You can't do justice to that dream without talking about reparations, what it means for New Jersey to acknowledge its history with slavery, the way it was shaped by slavery, and the enduring racial inequality that we confront today. And this task force would do two things. The first thing it would do is it would make that acknowledgment. It would tell that story accurately. The second thing it would do is they would make policy and other recommendations to repair that enduring harm. We had uh, a press conference two years ago. The bill was introduced and supported by nearly every black elected official, widely supported across the state of New Jersey. And we met with the Speaker of the Assembly, Craig Coughlin. We came to him and said, Speaker Coughlin, this is an important moment. Bill introduced to finally have this conversation that we're having now. And we're asking you to support the New Jersey Reparations Task Force. Again, I mentioned a task force. You all know, very often when politicians don't want to do something, they create a task force. <laughs> Real talk, right? We want to create a space to have a thoughtful conversation about how we might repair the enduring harm from slavery. And he said back to us, you know, Ryan, you know, the thing is, the word reparations, it just, it, ah, geez, it, it unsettles people. It makes them feel uncomfortable. Why, Rick Thigpen, can't we call it something else? We could even call it the Black Lives Matter Task Force or the, 
or the Racial Wealth Gap Task Force or the Inequity Task Force, but just reparations, the word itself is just, it's hard to digest. And we said back to Speaker Craig Coughlin, listen, the fact that we're asking you for a task force is itself the concession. And if we are to make a concession, the least we can do is be clear about what the thing will do. And so that conversation with him, bringing that truth to him, launched a campaign called Say the Word Reparations. And the idea is that if we want to do the thing to finally address what Dr. King lived and died for, the pursuit of freedom, we have to be willing to do those things that make us uncomfortable, including Say the Word Reparations. I want to say this one piece of truth before I move to the next part here. The 2020 census shows that New Jersey will soon be a majority people of color state. Incredible growth in the population of people of color alongside white folks. This, this growing diversity speaks to the way in which we have new people coming into the political fold, new voices in our state. It's a beautiful thing to see even this room is a reflection of what New Jersey looks like. One of the challenges, if we get really, really honest though, is that our state is segregated, not just across the state in our communities, but also in leadership. And so our state is governed, it's led by three most powerful people are white men. The governor, the Senate, uh, the president, and Assembly uh, Leader Coughlin, who I spoke about. And part of why the New Jersey Reparations Task Force that would focus on reparation hasn't moved is because our state is segregated at the top. We all know that even progressive-sounding politicians are keepers of the status quo if the people don't hold them to account. And so I will say this to you now, to uh, Minister Councilwoman Roundtree's point, those who lift their prophetic and unapologetic and unencumbered voices will move any politician, including those three white gentlemen at the top, to finally support this. I speak that into existence because part of what is powerful, as Dr. King recognized, is our advocacy to get elected officials to do the things they don't want to do. And so I brought, I brought some materials that will bring you to 400yearsnj.org. You can use this tool to communicate directly with your elected officials, including the governor. I think a lot about this idea that advocacy is power. It's the power to do a lot of things, to connect us to the prosperity and the opportunity in our state. It's the power to build the most inclusive democracy in America. It's the power to transform justice. It's the power to invest resources deeply into our young people. It's the power to hold those people in positions of power accountable. It's the power to take hold finally of the freedom and liberation inspired by Dr. King's dreams for which he lived and for which he was ultimately killed. And taking hold of that power through our collective advocacy is the work before us. As I think about our responsibility to move forward Dr. King's unfinished business, I want to lift up three things I think we ought to do. And the first thing is we have to be people who are inspired by a compelling vision to see beyond which the naked eye can see. I think vision is critical. Dr. King imagined a world that didn't yet exist, but which he believed could be made real if we organize ourselves collectively to advance power through advocacy. And this leads me to a story I love to share about my wife, Charity. I refer to her as Sunshine on, on this point. You all know that Charity was a, a longtime educator in the city of Newark, principal, <laughs> principal Avon Avenue School for 12 years and taught for 26 years before in this last year deciding after having run a marathon she was going to take a pause and ca catch her breath. She shared with me a story about a, a person who had applied for an opportunity to teach it at her school. And she talked to me the night before she would interview this candidate about how excited she was. All my man had to do was show up and do a halfway decent job at the interview and he'd get the job. That was it. On paper, he was precision. All she needed from him was a good interview, the job would be his. Keep that in mind, because this turns out to be one of the more cold-blooded stories about an interview that you'll hear. <laughs> Day comes, and my wife offers what she thinks of as a softball question. Listen, let's start the interview by you telling me 
what you see. And this promising candidate answers that question literally. Well, the applicant said, I see a dwindling student population, extreme poverty, decaying buildings, empty lots littered with garbage, police car, generally lots of despair. Pause. My wife responds to this once promising candidate <laughs> by saying, thank you, but you can't help us. I told you it was a cold-blooded interview. <laughs> it was one question. He's confused because, you know, he, he knows what he looks like on paper. He said, how did I just get one question? And I answered it, literally, and you're saying I can't help you. Confusion. She clears the confusion. It's important for you to recognize as you apply for your next opportunity, she tells him. I told you it was cold-blooded. This critical truth, and that is, she said, that the world outside of you is a reflection of what is inside of you. And if you're one of those people who only sees despair and empty lots that are with garbage and helplessness, then, she said, that's all there's ever going to be. And what she was saying to him was she was asking him about his vision, not what you see in this moment, but what, through this position, you advocating on behalf of the kids you could create around Avon Avenue School. And I think that is what Dr. King requires of us, that as we see what's before us and the places where we have influence, what do we want to create together through lifting our voices, through advocacy? The second thing is we have to, I think, be fearless truth tellers who do very uncomfortable things. My pastor, Philip A. Gilmore, the First Lady's husband at St. John's Community Baptist Church, shared with me a story about the role of truth tellers. And he said, truth tellers use their voices to make sure that people in positions of power are accountable to the people. And truth tellers stand with people in positions of power when they're doing right by the people. And of course, this powerful people, they love it. But because truth tellers also hold people in positions of power accountable, they're sometimes disliked and even hated by those powerful people. Bernice King said this about her father, Dr. King. At the time of my father's death, a poll reflects that my father was the most hated man in America. Most hated. Many who quote my father today and you would use him to deter justice likely don't know Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The reality is the person that we celebrate this morning was constantly under threat of imminent death. He was subjected to relentless FBI wiretapping, ruthless harassment, and ultimately he was killed. And Dr. King's example teaches us that whether liked or beloved, disliked or loved, truth tellers by their very nature are required to tell the truth because we are accountable to the people too. And finally, in pursuit of our compelling vision, we have to be willing to both lead and follow courageously. You know, one of the most striking things about Dr. King is that he came into leadership at the age of 26. 26, think about that. In 1963, when he was 33, he predicted with prophetic precision that America would elect a black president in the 2000s. He gave perhaps his most important speech ever at the age of 34. And if he had lived today, he would have been a millennial. And he died at the age, he died at the age of 39 before he reached 40. And I think there's a lesson in leadership here which is that Dr. King's elders poured into him in such a way that he was ready to lead at 26. And perhaps more importantly, his elders were willing to follow him at 26. And this is a challenging question for us, those of us of a certain age, which is what 26-year-olds are we nurturing? Because if we waited for Dr. King to turn 40 to come into leadership, there would not be a holiday today. And I think that that's what this moment requires of us. 
that were people. That we are people inspired by a compelling vision that allows us to see beyond that which the naked eye can see. That we're fearless truth tellers who do uncomfortable things. One of my uh, mentors, Elise Body, says that every day when you wake up, you should be nervous about what the day holds because you're stretching yourself to go into uncomfortable spaces. And the moment you wake up and you feel like, I got it today, you need to find something else to do. Because that uncomfortable piece keeps you sharp. It keeps you alert. It doesn't allow you to fall asleep. And finally, in pursuit of our compelling vision, we have to be willing to lead and to follow courageously. I began by talking about Dr. King's mountaintop speech. And at the end of his life, he knew that he was near death. He longed for more years than he knew he had. And he had a conversation with God where he says, strangely enough, if I could ask you, God, I would ask you to allow me to live just a few years into the second half of the 20th century. And then he said, in communicating with God, I would be happy. And I thought about that. What if, Dr. King, if God granted Dr. King's prayer? If Dr. King had lived a few years into the second half of the 20th century, he would have seen the promise fulfilled of his march over the Edmund Pettus Bridge, which led to the passage of the Voting Rights Act in 1965. And within one generation, this country elected its first black president, Barack Obama. He would have seen that. Dr. King would have been 79. He would have then seen President Barack Obama appoint the first black attorney general, Eric Holder. He would have then also seen uh, Barack Obama appoint the second black, first female, black female attorney general, Loretta Lynch. But if Dr. King had lived eight more years to 2016, when he would have been 87, he would have lived to see white supremacy return to the White House. And perhaps Dr. King would have then reminded us that as the American story goes, you cannot have one without the other. You can't have progress without attempts to roll it back. You simply cannot have President Barack Obama without then having President Donald Trump. That has always been the experience, particularly for black people in this country, that democracy by its very essence, has always been contested, including at this very moment, which is why Dr. King continued in that last speech. He said this. He said, the world is all messed up. The nation is sick. Trouble is in the land. Confusion is all around. But he said, but I know somehow that only when it is dark enough can you see the light. And I see God working in this period of the 20th century in a way that people, in some strange way, are responding. Something is happening in our world. The masses of people are rising up. Think about the George Floyd protests in the last two years, some of the biggest social movements in American history. And whenever people are assembled today, continue to think about the George Floyd protests, whether they are in Johannesburg, South Africa, Nairobi, Kenya, Accra, Ghana, New York City, Atlanta, Georgia, Jackson, Mississippi, Memphis, Tennessee, or Newark, New Jersey, I'll add. The cry is always the same. And that is that we want to be free. And so it is with us that this fight for freedom continues, inspired by Dr. King's commitment, ultimate sacrifice for it, right here in New Jersey. And so let us use our collective advocacy to take hold of that power to win that fight. God bless you and thank you so much.